Uh, all right. Uh, good morning. Can the Zoom people hear me too? All right, so let's get started. Good morning. My name is Ray. Um, I'll be starting my C lecture here today. So we're just going to be picking off from Dr. Dog's lecture where we kind of end up with this photo. Uh, this photo is pretty much uh, taken from our disaster day and you know, why did we do, wait, why did we have a disaster day, right? It's kind of a way to, for us to kind of get familiarized in terms of any sort of like, you know, large scale accidents happens um, in, a, in a pretty much broad spectrum uh, for patient care. But in, for me today, um, the scope of this lecture, I want to kind of scale it down to each individual level, uh, especially for uh, us uh, as like that, uh, you know, residents, staff, um, uh, people around you, and just for yourself, really. Uh, so the reason I want to talk about today is the safety habits um, and especially like, occupational hazards in the emergency room. Uh, and the goal is really to establish self-safety habits and awareness surrounding you and yourself um, in, order, in, order, in order to pretty much protect yourself and prevent any sort of accident uh, regarding you or your colleagues. Um, something like this, you don't want anything like this to happen at the first five minutes, right? So, you know, you walked in with coffee, ready to start shit, and all of a sudden, you know, you had an accident like this happen. And that's something that, you know, you want to prevent. So, you know, let's start by talking about a little bit about habits, right? What are habits? They are pretty much triggered automatically. Um, in terms of things like uh, contextual cues that kind of associate with the performance. Um, it's, kind of, it's pretty much a learning mechanism that you learn by doing first. So when you first learn it, you kind of like engage it, and then as you, you keep on doing it repetitively uh, and consistently, you end up being, and it becomes more of a conscious to a subconscious, and becomes more automatic and natural as you keep on doing it. Um, it's a mental shortcut. It helps with your efficiency and pretty much kind of, uh, tells the brain, I just work in the past and this is what I'm going to be doing for this cue. Um, it's pretty much literally like when XYZ happens, I do ABC, that kind of thing. Um, it is a dual, um, dual mind concept there. So we're talking about a intentional mind, which is kind of goal-directed, and then there's also an habitual mind, which is like the less conscious part of it. So in, in the goal-directed mind, you'll be more conscious about it, you'll be more logical, you're decalculating and more thinking about it, um, and which is happens to occur in the front of look. But in the more habitual one, it's the uh, limbic system that kind of takes over, so this is a fast, automatic, happens like, pretty frequently and um, it's very it's subconscious. So you sometimes maybe you're doing it and you're not even aware about, about of it. Um, so the world safety habits agree that about 40% of our daily activities is habitual. Um, and the rest of it is pretty much like conscious. Um, this is important if, uh, the part of the brain's framework just to kind of free up the mental resources so we don't exhaust our brain's um, activity at the beginning of our day. And in, the, in, in ED, like many of our actions is pretty much routine, right? Um, so as I said, it's more efficient uh, and we're all about doing efficiency in the ED. So what's important for, for us, you know, as staff, as, as uh, uh, workers in the department, um, there was a study that was done by uh, a psychologist, Wendy Woods. Uh, she did a study where they, they, she had like participants um, taste like popcorns, fresh and stale popcorns. And of course, most, almost everyone would prefer the fresh popcorn over the stale one. But then what, and then they put everyone in the uh, movie theater where they had them watch the movie and gave them fresh and stale popcorn. And what, they, what she found was that um, in people that normally, you know, eat popcorn during the movie theaters, they ate the same amount of fresh popcorn and stale popcorn, um, the same, like, the same amount without any sort of like, um, issues. So the conclusion was that in any sort of, uh, um, like the intentional mind, the conscious mind is very easily derailed when you are, you are engaged in something else or distracted by something else. So this probably brings to the next uh, study where in EM in particular, we're pretty susceptible to like, stress, fatigue, um, burnout rates are high as well. And in a study done, a separate study that was done, uh, which shows that in, in times of stress, people are very prone 
um, that slipping back to it habits, where it is the good habit, bad habit, the danger ha dangerous habits uh, as well. Um, and especially for the point for us uh, as clinicians, for, for when we're doing like systematic and heuristic on differential diagnosis, where we're doing our medical dishes, uh, decision making, um, as well as procedures, um, we, our so called muscle memory is the prime example of habits. Um, rush, when you're rushing as well, and at the end of shift, when you're like, exhausted, tired after 8, 10, 12 hour shift, maybe a 20 hour, 24 hour shift from, from the ICU. Um, so you don't want to, when you're doing any sort of like things, you want to be more conscious, like any sort of, like, especially in an environment where things like this hazard stuff, you want to be like conscious, mindful, be awake, and not like these people here kind of just like <laughs> knocked out and be like, not be aware because when you're sleeping, you actually, the, that, that's the, when you're actually like sleeping, you actually don't, that's when you're the most vulnerable um, aspect of time. Um, so just be aware of surroundings, you know. Um, so here are some examples, uh, I guess, for the people in the, uh, the conference. Just if you think think of this example as a, is, if it is a bad habit that you think that, just maybe raise your hand. And then I guess for the people on Zoom, um, just think of it like these examples. Like, do you want your child um, to have this kind of habits in the future or not? And you could probably help, you know, think about it. So let's start. So, you know, in the morning, you wake up, brush your teeth and clean your space. Uh, so kind of like the first thing you do in the morning rather than cleaning your phone or grabbing something else to do, right? Um, wash your hands before eating. Is that a good habit, bad habit? Talking about chewing. Is that a bad habit or a good habit, right? What about putting on a seatbelt when getting up again into a car? Being on a phone while driving, right? Cleaning up yourself. Or perhaps just sweeping, sweeping the, the plums onto the floor instead of picking up. Right? So, of course, uh, you want to clean up yourself and stuff like that. So, moving on to the department in the emergency room. So, when you drop something, for me, I kind of like automatically or instead, instinctively just like, try to grab the stuff before I fall to the ground. But sometimes it's a bad um, like a bad habit have. So when you're about to drop a pen, you try to grab it. What about you, when you're about to drop a paper or EKG? Drop an ultra sample. Uh, you want to catch this before it hits the ground. What about an unsheathed scalpel, a scalpel or a, a needle, right? This one you don't want to catch. What about when you're integrating, you put the blade on the right side rather than, rather than the left side. Is that a good habit, right? So the inconsistency is pretty much in the key in the context. Um, you, could, you pretty much could choose which side you want to be, right? Um, it could be a good habit, bad habit, um, that you want to kind of uh, be consistent with. Um, so for this step, I want you guys to develop a positive you know, vibe to it, um, develop a positive habit um, to it. Uh, so let's kind of switch gears for a little bit. We're going to talk about um, like hazards, uh, healthcare hazards in general. Um, there, so there's four, uh, defining four types. Uh, there's physical, psychological, uh, there's hazardous agents and ergonomics. So when we talk about physical, we're talking about any sort of like building infrastructure, the, the lights surrounding you, the gas pipes, um, that could pretty much like, or even like anything that burns you, causes lags, falls, etc. And then psychological could be the um, patient human relationship, uh, staff relationship, uh, which kind of includes a lot of different stuff, which we'll I'll go over in a little bit. Um, and then there's uh, hazardous, uh, which we kind of go with since the medical, and these can include like biological, chemical, blood-borne disease, airborne disease. Um, and then last one, economic, uh, ergonomics, which is kind of includes like physical stuff, like lifting, repetitive motion. Um, or standing like high strains and things like that. Um, so in the ED, we pretty much it's, uh, always like, has these four um, types of uh, hazards that we are constantly exposed to. So in terms of chemical biological, we all get like exposure to like blood. Um, now with COVID, we be like um, airborne as well um, and contacts. 
Uh, when it comes to physical, it could be assaults, slip and fall, um, and some mechanical hazards. Um, and then radiation, which for us is mostly uh, the portable x-rays that we tend to get exposed to. Maybe CTs, but mostly not, because we tend to stand behind the, uh, the windows at that time. And the big one is uh, psycho, uh, psychosocial and emotional, where, you know, um, I'm sure like majority of us has high experience this with discrimination, harassment, um, and in the recent last year and the last last year with the EMR changes, that's another big stressor. Um, malfunctioning equipment all the time, right? Uh, understaff, violence in the ED. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we typically handle. Um, and th also this kind of pretty much overlaps with uh, other lectures that we've been given throughout uh, years in the residency, active shooters, how to handle that, uh, violent patient, the, the escalating techniques, um, impact patients that are just unaware of what they're doing. Um, and this is the 2019 U.S. Bureau of Labor on Healthcare Occupation. I'm just going to simplify it down to the um, healthcare occupation. So if we look over here, this about 50,000 uh, during, uh, during that year reported with like, non fatal injuries. And what I want to point out here is that, or at least from residents, uh, dispositions, I think they categorize as a one big group, where for, but then what I, what I want to point out is that for residents and uh, even with attendees that, as well, that we do the work of like nursing, we do the work of technician, technologists, and nursing aides. So at any point, we could, cap, we could be in either category and the, the rate of the injuries is actually, you know, pretty significant um, during these uh, moments um, of exposures. And these kind of long fatal um, occupational injuries, which kind of includes like sprains, strains, fractures, uh, contusion, burns, cuts, uh, tendinitis, trauma, and there. Um, so, you know, we we'll often talk about patient safety. We always talk about that, right? That's like kind of the number one thing that we often talk about. But who's keeping us safe? Like, are we the ones be responsible for our safety or are you responsible? Um, and this is why it's something I want to talk about today. So, like, as a team, we should be keeping each other safe. Like, me keeping myself safe, I want to keep you safe so that um, nothing happens to our colleagues and we kind of, you know, be in a team. And we work as a team. Um, so, I just want to go over some examples. So, here, let's say, uh, overnight shift, um, we have resident A and resident B. You know, resident A went to outside, got some food, you know, come back and eat at the, at the workstation. Then comes over resident B where they forgot to print labels and come over with gloves or urine samples, blood samples, <laughs> and stuff, you know, label it right next to you eating, right? You find that disgusting. Like, I agree, actually. <laughs> so, um, right? Uh, so now, let's say that at 7 a.m., change of shift, right? It's a busy board. They sign out a very busy board. So the residents um, at 7 a.m. or like at 7.30 just start seeing patients without doing anything further. Um, lunchtime comes, and then once the breakfast, the board's a little, little more control now. Resident B went to get food and eat at their station. With, let's say without cleaning their, their, their station, right? Who find that disgusting? Because like, <laughs> like, like the previous person was just doing like gloves and urine sample and blood samples right at your station, um, and now you're eating on that on that area right now, right? I I actually this is one of my pet peeves. So, um, so what I want to do, uh, I just want to want to want to come across to you guys is that you know clean, sanitize and clean your workspace frequently, uh, especially in the times of COVID right now, which is even more important. And also make it a specimen free zone. Then make it a habit of being like you don't bring specimen there, leave it at the patient's bedside. Um, and also this is this example is not to promote any eating in the workstation because of infection infection control and because we're in pandemic right now. There are um, uh, lounges in the CCT and in the peace lounge room that you could use to eat. And I always try to get my uh, uh, get people to eat over there rather than eating at the workstation. 
So, you know, over here, Chris talked to them. Now, I don't know if he washed his hand over there and touched his burger. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dr. Fresh. This is taking my we were in sick you. You know, what I want to point out to you is that she took a glove and gave the hands. So, how many of you took extra gloves, right? And either they fall to the ground and then you pick it up and just like shove it back through the box. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know whether this is, um, you know, dirty or not, but, you know, it's kind of things to be mindful of. Right. So moving on, um, we tend to expose ourselves to blood almost every single show. Right. Uh, either do it to family, do it trauma, IVs, etc. Um, and OSHA pretty much defines any, like um, like these bloodborne or potential infectious disease to be anything that affects blood in there. So any sort of bodies of uh, the wisps, which include like um, semen, vaginal secretions. Uh, saliva, dental procedures, um, any other like synovial fluid, body fluids as well. Um, and for this one, can someone or one of the juniors, I guess, try to identify what is wrong with this photo on the uh, on the right over here? Gloves, yeah. So CSF is actually like one of the um, the most uh, in fact, our most uh, com uh, most infectious uh, body fluids that we trust that's what that are transmissible of like pathogens. Um, the other one is pretty much uh, I right. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, very, uh, at least for statistics that shows that the lack of uh, eye protection is one of the most frequently uh, trans uh, transmission. Um, among all types of blood, um, like blood exposures. This is even more true if, we're, if you're doing any sort of like wound care, trauma, where, you know, patients have like blood squirting all over the place, right? Um, and this is like, it holds, it holds true for all of the one traumas that we go to. So one thing to do, you know, protect your eyes, right? That's the kind of one thing as well, when I see like um, residents, especially like interns and uh, juniors, like they doing like, wound care, lack of repairs without a, a face shield. I, I try to get them one or I like, tell them to get one before doing so. Um, unfortunately, I also was guilty of it myself. Um, I think this was uh, last year at Lutheran where just like right before pandemic hit, we had like a young uh, elderly female with an eye trauma. And I was standing, uh, let's say it was on the left side. I was standing on the right side of the patient's bed and the surgical resident was standing on the rooms on the left side. So he was examining the eye and I guess they, they maybe like, like put some pressure on it and a whole bunch of blood just like squirt out right at him. I don't think it hit his face or anything, but at that, after that, like me and the surgical resident just like finally walked out and just grabbed ourselves the surgical mask and go back in and examine the patient's bed. So, you know, just be aware of these things that happen um, and then be very, again, very cautious about it. So protect your eyes uh, in the end. Um, now, the next one is that I want to point out that, um, so if there's a COVID-66, let's say in the waiting room of the pod, right, how many of us will be kind of like the initial ones to go out there, like rush out there or things like that? I'll leave it one of them, right? Who would kind of, kind of scale back just maybe five, 10 seconds to maybe grab a face shield, grab a, at least grab, grab a set of gloves, right? You should think about that, right? So in, in all initial evaluation, uh, you should think about scene safety, right? You shouldn't be rushing into the patient when you hear any sort of like 06, 06, 99 without first looking at around you. Right? Who knows if the patient that had most sticks sticks outside the pod in the waiting room, like the newly built doors that still last on that one thing, right? You don't want to be going out there and then coming, um, and coming out like this. <laughs> so, and this is pretty much very analog and analogous to the firefighters, right? They all geared up before, um, before going in, well prepared, make sure everyone checks each other before they go in to fight the fire. Uh, and, then, and then they go in, right? If there's a fire and there's a victim inside, the provider won't be going in with scrubs, right? That's just illogical and um, irresponsible too. 
Uh, so, you know, have it, protect yourself, uh, gear up, uh, especially in the time of COVID, make sure, make sure your colleagues as well get it up um, before, you know, going to taking care of the patient uh, so that you can pretty much save others um, with it. So the last one I want to talk about is needle sharps. You know, like needle injuries is pretty common um, at about half a million each year in hospitals. And just among our, our own residents here, I know at least 10 people that, in, that got a needle stick. Um, plus, my, like, plus my, my minus the last three years and plus, uh, well, my, yeah, minus the, the last three classes and the class of, like three classes of both being as well. Um, and really this often occurs to you know doctors, nurses, and technologists. Um, and doctors uh, physicians like about 37% uh, or, uh, or uh, compared to any other occupational group and nurses are like 36%. Uh, and maybe close to half of the physician category or sustained the injuries are sustained by interns and residents. And then the last uh, is pretty much um, uh, pathologists and technologists are pretty much equivalent at 70%. Um, so you know, why did it happen? So it happens because most of us, like, or happens during when you're fatigued. Um, about 50% is due to um, when you're tired, uh, and then 30% when you're like, having like lack of subsistence, where you're only one there, patients like flinging around and you just couldn't control it. Uh, and, and then the last part of it would be like when you're like rushing, uh, when you're trying to like at your end of shift, or there's like a whole bunch of patients to be seen, you're just like rushing to do things, and that's that's like kind of a setup for disasters. Um, but remember back when I was at the beginning of the talk, where when the studies found that when you're like rushing, you're stressed, you're fatigued, you're distracted, you're prone to back on like prone to like going back to your old habits. Um, so any sort, of, and it, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter what kind of habit, what good habit, bad habit. It's just your your habit. So now these are the general areas where the injuries tend to occur. So procedures, disposable uh, procedures, disposables, and you know IV to body and uh, uh, injections. So I'm going to ask attending on this one. Um, let's see. <laughs> That's so great. You're the disaster person. Where, which one do you think is the most common, uh, most like common place where uh, people sustain injuries? Probably injectable needles. Injectable needles, like this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what about the seniors? Uh, Bobby, you want to take a take a shot? At? No pun intended. Needles. <laughs> needles. Okay. Um, any juniors? Uh, <coughs> Alec, where are you? Yeah, I saw you here. Uh, procedures. Procedures. Okay. So, unfortunately, like, um, uh, it turns out that shot disposable is actually when it occurs the most. Mm -hmm. About 31.7% is say when well, injuries occur during shot disposable, the, this, uh, disposal. And then 21% is when doing procedures. So, any sort of operative procedures, central line placement, or something like that. And then the last three, or each of them, are like about 13% um, of injuries during like phlebotomy, IVs, and injections. Um, so, you know, we want to be smart with sharps. Like this will literally illustrate everything I want to talk about. So, you don't want to be like forced, like shoving any sort of um, shots into the full container. Um, you don't want to bend a needle and you don't want to be like uh, putting your fingers into the shop container. That's that's just like not smart. Um, and the last one which I want to go over is that recapping needles. Like a lot of times also patients are uh, 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 healthcare workers tend to injure themselves when they recap the needles. So especially when you do it like this. Um, when you do it like this, like you know you are pretty much putting, putting yourself at risk for any sort of um, needle stick because who knows if like right beside you, right behind someone might be coming up from you and not seeing what you're doing and just like bump onto your elbow and just like accidentally just like stick it to yourself. So, so never do it that way, um, uh, especially when you're distracting or when you're teaching someone or multitasking. Uh, 
But, you know, if you do need, really need to, like a clean needle that you just like, you know, you just take talk out like Lao came from, um, to make a habit to kind of like do it this way where you put the cap on a table and kind of scoop it up with the needle. And once the needle is in the cap, then secure it with your other hand. Um, that's, this is probably one of the, the, the ways, the most common way that, um, that we get taught about as well, and it's most efficient. Um, now, talk about procedures, right? Procedures is another way that we tend to do a lot, especially central lines. Um, do you want the tray to be like something like this, where you have all your, uh, what, all your shots in one, uh, in like many different places? where then you're just setting up yourself to kind of bomb into yourself. So they have the, the manufacturer made the, this little thing right here where you can put all the shots in one single place for a reason. And that's not kind of what one habit. I want to point out that just keep your shots in one single place, regardless of what kind of procedure you're doing or what part of, or in what step of the procedure, as long as you know where your shot is, it doesn't matter what you have in, in the field. Like you know your shot is one single place, it's kind of, you're safe from it, you're, you're protecting your, your junior colleagues from it. Yes, that's the word. This is a similar thing that I always teach the residents when they're doing other procedures without a trick. When you have those metal dishes, put your scalpel in there, put your needles in there, they always go into something hard so they can't be stuck on it. This way you always know where they are. This way you won't stick yourself. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Silverberg also mentioned that if there's a no tray, like get something like get a uh, no, like no um, no central line tray, but get something else like a, like a like a basin or a beanie um, to put the all, all the shots in it and something hard, so then you know um, any all the shots will go in one single place as well. Um, yeah. So okay. So kind of the last sec uh, section of it, I just want to talk about like developing new habits. So it kind of goes into, you know, you have, a, you have a cue and then you kind of do a routine and then it becomes a reward. So first you've got to have a, what we call an initiation phase where you're kind of defining like the new behavior in the context of doing it. And then once you define that, you start, yeah, and then the behavior will be repeated um, during this time. And you might adjust it uh, from time to time just to like, find, find, like kind of like try and error kind of thing. And then once you start doing it re repeatedly, it becomes a stability phase. Uh, and at this point, as you keep doing it and doing it repeatedly, it becomes more of a habit. Um, and this is what we call muscle memory when we do procedures and things like that. Um, so some example would be, you know, after like, you examine a patient, you get the habit of washing hands, and what the reward would be if you have clean hands and less spreading of the disease between patients. Um, and this uh, is pretty much like, you know, step by step where we kind of, how you want to develop your own new set of things. So once you decide a, like a goal, then, you know, you get a simple action and you want to be consistent. So being consistent is really the key here. Um, Whenever I say on the slide, it summarizes in one sentence, like repeating action consistently in the same context. Um, so safety habits is very important, at least for um, us as physicians, because it's self-protection for one, and it's also leads to like career long longevity, right? Like I said, it overlaps with wellness, it overlaps with all the de de-escalation techniques and um, safety techniques that we learn throughout our residency lectures. So let's just kind of be playing the double advocate, right? So what if you get injured, right? You worry your family, you worry, you spend the time, money, going to doctors, to pick up medications, um, days are sick, um, and, if, and you also put a burden on your colleagues, uh, you know, to pick up work in, if, you want, if you want to really go that route. So that's pretty much it. Um, any questions, comments, you know? Very important. Very good. Thank you. Very much. So just to end, um, you are in control, right? Pretty much for your own exposure, for your own protection, um, exposure of risks surrounding you. Um, so I do want to take this moment to thank all our faculty, our residents, uh, my class, my uh, co-residents, for all the patience and training and teaching us for the last four years. Um, I applaud that, you know, we weren't really like, uh, very, very rowdy and stuff, but I. <laughs> uh, but this four years has been a very, very fun year. Thank you so much.